Hope you guys are doing good. It's been a long time since I've made a video, but I have a midterm coming up for my final physics class in undergrad um, on a solid state physics course. So I'm gonna review by again making videos. So hopefully this will help someone if you guys just wanna listen along. And you might notice from the top, I'm gonna be starting from chapter three. And we have a slightly different format since um, uh, my computer, old computer, wasn't working. This is all I could get it to work. But okay, without further ado, let's do chapter three, where, as you guys can see, you guys will have the textbook on the left side that I'll be going through, and then I'll be writing my kind of notes on the right side. So chapter three is going to start with, um, it's about crystal binding and elastic constants. Uh, we're going to start with basically kind of how the bond interactions work, starting with Van der Waals. Um, and then learn about cohesive energy, then get into ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and so forth. So, okay, without further ado, let's get into the crystals of inert gases. So, all right. So, basically, we have different kinds of bondings. Here we have argon, right? Argon noble gas. Um, it's going to have Van der Waals interactions, right? Because all of its shells are filled. Sodium chloride, salt. Um, it's going to have ionic bonds, and then sodium has metallic, and then diamond has covalent. So we'll get into what all these are, but yeah. So basically, what we care about in this chapter is basically how do crystals work? How do they stay together? How are they attached? Are they just tiny little springs on each atoms connected to others? Or is there something deeper going on? So we're going to learn about Van der Waals forces, covalent bonds, and so forth. And we're also going to learn about a term <coughs> called the cohesive energy. Cohesive energy, which put simply, is defined as the energy that must be added to a crystal to separate its components into a neutral free atom at rest at infinite separation with the same electronic configuration. In other words, it's kind of like the gravitational potential thing. If I have two things right here, how much energy do I need to take this guy off to infinity where the potential is zero? Okay, so let's see. So if we look at inert gases, um, inert gases have full valence shells. Um, they form the simplest crystals. The electron distribution is very close to that of free atoms and their properties of absolute zero are summarized in table four. So table four, that's very far down, okay. So here we have kind of some, a table of the cohesive energies. Hopefully you guys can see my mouse. And what's interesting to note here is if you look at the noble gases, right? If we just look at EV per atom, because I think that's the easiest one to visualize, look how small the energies are for the noble gases versus like, uh, I don't know, iron. Iron is a much higher one, right? And that's because the noble gases only deal with Van der Waals interactions, which we'll get into momentarily. Uh, melting points, similarly, right, because melting points are going to be intrinsically linked to kind of the cohesive energy, right, because melting points is like, how can you break the bonds, or at what point can you break the bonds, they have much lower melting points, and that's why these guys are almost always gases when we see them. This is in Kelvin, by the way. Okay, and then, kind of have to tilt your head for this one. Uh, we'll learn about what the bulk moduli and compressibilities are later on, so let's not talk about that now. But okay. So properties of inert gases, which is extrapolated to zero Kelvin and zero pressure. Um, nice. Okay. All right. Anyways. So basically, what holds an inert gas uh, crystal together? So Van der Waals. So let's start with Van der Waals. So what is Van der Waals? Van der Waals, I guess, London interaction. London interaction. Okay, so let's consider two identical inert gas atoms at a separation R large in comparison to the radiative atoms. So here are my two atoms, and they're separated by a distance R. Okay, and then they all have like their little R's, but you know, R is much, much bigger than the little R. Okay, so the charge distributions, distributions of the atoms are rigid. Like you imagine, it's just like a spherical ball with a uniformly distributed charge. Right, um, the electrostatic potential of a spherical blah blah would be canceled outside um, a neutral atom by the electrostatic potential of the charge on the nucleus. So you basically be getting like zero E field, 
from each of them, right? However, um, then, right, if we bring them close together like this, uh, they won't actually bond together, right? Because both of their contributions add up to zero. But um, if we instead think about um, that these electron shells are changing over time, right? It's kind of like not really orbiting the nucleus, but we have that cloud, right? Probability cloud of electrons around. So we can consider two identical linear harmonic oscillators separated by R, looking something like this. Uh, I think it's minus, and then it's plus. These are This is like the spring or whatever. And then we have another one over here, minus, plus. And here's our spring. You guys see we have kind of a dipole moment here, and these can kind of oscillate, right? So let me first grab the diagram for you guys right here just so I can draw on it. Okay, I did it backwards, but it's the same thing, right? You see what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, what we can do then is we can write the Hamiltonian of the system. So we know each um, nucleus uh, has a charge, or oscillator has a charge of plus or minus E, right? 1.6 times 10 to 19. Um, so we can basically write the Hamiltonian for the system, which uh, 1 over 2m p1 squared plus 1 over 2 some constant for the force constants x1 squared plus 1 over 2m momentum 2 squared plus uh, force constant again x2 squared. Okay, we have our kind of kx squared over there. All right, and then we basically have uh, since they're uncoupled oscillators, we can assume a frequency of omega naught, and therefore C is equal to m omega naught squared. So this just looks like your general Hamiltonian for a linear harmonic oscillator. Okay, um, ionization energies, whatever, doesn't really matter. Okay, long story short, the total energy required to move the first two electrons is the sum of the first and second ionization potentials. So clearly, if we look at, um, just gonna have to tilt your head for this one. Look at argon again. It has a pretty high ionization energy this time, right? Because it has a full valence shell filled, so it's gonna hard to remove that away. It likes to be filled. It doesn't want its electrons to be moved. Okay. All right. So um, then um, we can write uh, the Coulomb interaction as the Hamiltonian as H one, and the Coulomb interaction, right? Um, like kqq over r but we're doing it in cgs units so we basically just get rid of the constants saying they're all one so it's e squared over r right for this to this okay then it's uh e squared over r plus x1 minus x2 so r plus x1 is this to this okay and then we have minus, right? Because you have a positive electron, a positive charge or negative charge. So you have E times negative E, so minus. Minus E squared over R plus X1. And then minus E squared over R minus X2. R minus X2 is this distance right here. And then R plus X1 is these two right here. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense. Um, and then what we can do is in the approximation that x1 x2 is much much less than r we can expand to obtain in lowest order um hamiltonian one is basically minus 2 e squared x1 x2 over r cubed okay so then the total Hamiltonian uh, has the form for H1 can be diagonalized. So we get Xs is equal to one over root two, X1 plus X2. And then A is equal to, or is defined as, these are all defined, one over root two, X1 minus X2. Uh, for the summation of the difference ones, and then if we solve for x1 and x2, we get kind of x1 is equal to 1 over root 2, xs plus xa, and then x2 is equal to 1 over root 2, xs minus xa. 
and <clears throat> A and S refer to the symmetric and anti-symmetric modes of motion. Uh, um, given by symmetric, they add and asymmetric. It's the difference. Um, so we have momentums, PS and PA associated with the X-ray. So we can say P1 is equal to one over root two of the symmetric plus the anti-symmetric momentum PA. And then P2 is defined as one over root two symmetric minus the anti-symmetric. So then therefore we can write to the total Hamiltonian, right? H, which is equal to H0 plus, or H not whatever, H1, um, is equal to 1 over 2m ps squared plus 1 half c minus 2e squared over r cubed, remember from our approximation or toe expansion, and then plus 1 over 2m pa squared plus 1 half c plus 2e squared over r cubed x a squared okay and then we can do the same thing we always do with hamiltonians find out what omega is so omega is equal to square root c plus or minus 2e squared over r cubed um oh crap all divided by m right we just do that from you basically just take like it's one half omega squared x, right? And you need to put the m in there, and then you're chilling. Like for uh, from if you guys remember from Jesus Christ, like your harmonic oscillator class, I forget what it's called. So we get the um, omega naught frequency. We can expand. So we get omega naught is equal to oh, sorry, which equals sorry. We can take out omega naught, and then we get one plus or minus one half. 2e squared over cr cubed minus 1 eighth, and then the same thing, 2e squared over cr cubed, but squared, because it's an expansion, and we just keep going. Okay, so, all right. So the zero point energy of the system is given by 1 half h bar omega s plus omega a, so symmetric and anti-symmetric. Because the interaction, the sum is lowered from the uncoupled value, two times one half h bar omega naught by so, change in potential is one half h bar. The delta of the change in the symmetric and the change in the anti-symmetric, which is negative h bar omega naught times one eighth two e squared over c r cubed squared. Just bringing this down. Uh, which is minus, I guess they leave a constant A over R6. So the point is it goes by 1 over R6. Okay, so the attractive interaction varies as the minus 6th power of the separation of the two oscillators. And the point of all this, right, is to realize that the Van der Waals interaction is very, very weak. So um, it's also known as the London interaction or the induced dipole-dipole interaction. And for inert crystals, like inert crystals of inert gases, uh, and also many organic molecules from know, biology class or organic chemistry classes. Um, so basically, it's a quantum effect in the sense that as um, the change in potential goes to zero, h bar goes to zero. So the zero point energy of the system is lowered by the dipole dipole coupling of equation three. Equation three is the Hamiltonian, right? Because we have 2e squared minus whatever, x1, x2 over r cubed so it goes to zero right as r goes to infinity okay so the van der waals interaction does not depend for its existence on any overlap of the charge densities of the two atoms okay so the approximate value of the constant a and nine this constant right here uh, for identical atoms is given by so a is approximately h bar omega naught alpha squared where h bar omega naught is the strongest optical absorption line and alpha is the electron polarizability, which we'll see in a much later chapter, which I don't know if I'll get to because chapter 15 seems very far away, <laughs> but we'll see. Okay, so that's the attractive interaction, right? However, we also have, as two atoms are brought together, right? Their charge, distribu their charge distributions, right? Electron clouds, whatever, gradually start to overlap 
which changes the electrostatic energy of the system. When you get sufficiently close, the overlap energy is repulsive, right? Because imagine I have a little plus here and an orbiting minus, a little plus here, orbiting minus. These two boys get too close together. They don't want to be that close together. And then these two guys are also repelling each other. Okay. Um, and basically, a lot of this happens due to the Pauli exclusion principle, which from your quantum mechanics class is right. Basically tells us that you can't, like fermions have to, they don't want to be in the same state, right? So, cannot have all their quantum numbers equal. So, when the charge distribution of two atoms overlap, there's a tendency for electrons from atom B to occupy in part states of atom A already occupied by the electrons of atom A and vice versa. Okay, so basically in the simplest case, right, we have a hydrogen and a hydrogen. One to spin up, one to spin down, and then we get the net effect, right, of you can fill their valence shell kind of, or a helium, right, has one spin up, one spin down. I guess fusion, yay. Um, however, if you have two upspin hydrogens and they form together, you get one spin up and another spin up, but you get it in a different shell, right? So then your total energy is much higher versus if you had the, um, the spin up and the spin down together. So, okay, nice. So the Pauli uh, principle prevents multiple occupancy, right? Fermions can't share the same state. Um, and electrons and distributions with closed shells can overlap only if accompanied by the partial promotion of electrons to unoccupied high energy of the atoms. Basically what happened in figure B. It's figure five, right? No, it's not, okay. I guess this is figure five, they just didn't label it. Oh, uh, okay. So we're not actually trying to evaluate the repulsive interaction from first principles. Um, but we can get experimental data on the inert gases can be fitted well by an empirical repulsive potential of the form B over R to, does that say 12? I guess it's 12, where B is a positive constant when used together with long range attractive potential of the form nine. Equation nine was R kind of R over six, zero, yeah, okay. So let's see, so it's usual to write the total potential energy of the two atoms at a separation R as U of R for two atoms is equal to four epsilon. And then we have sigma over R to 12 minus sigma over R to the six, where this right here is what we calculated before with the A over R six. And this is our new uh, to the 12th, R to the 12th. Okay. Uh, where epsilon and sigma are the new parameters. So four epsilon sigma to the six is defined as A, and or we can define it. Uh, four epsilon sigma to the 12 is defined as B. Okay, so the potential, this one right here, the Leonard Jones potential, um, uh, shows us, well, if we look at the, uh, this is figure six, yeah. Uh, if you look at the force from it, by just taking, you know, force is negative du, dr, um, we can basically do calculations. So we see that as you get super, super, super close, boom, the potential jumps up. So the atoms can't actually touch, right? Um, and then as you get <coughs> farther away, uh, you go away from the minimum. So the minimum is some kind of little happy point, roughly over here. Okay, um, and if we look at table four, values of epsilon sigma are given. Table four was up here, I'm pretty sure. There you go. We had the values of epsilon and sigma. These are the parameters in the Leonard Jones potential. And we see that as you go up in the periodic table of elements, we get a higher epsilon and a higher sigma. Okay, sigma is given in angstroms. Okay, it's a unit of length. Okay, so other empirical forms are always okay. okay. Whatever. All right. So now we can talk about equilibrium, equilibrium lattice constants. We always want to talk about equilibrium. So if we in neglect the kinetic energy of the inert gas atoms, 
The cohesive energy of an inert gas crystal is given by summing the Leonard-Jones potential over all pairs of atoms in the crystal. Right, so Leonard-Jones potential tells us how two atoms add together. So if you want to find the total energy of the system, we just sum over all of them. So we can say the total potential energy is one half n times four epsilon n is the number of atoms. Uh, sigma j, I guess prime, I don't know why they're putting a prime, but whatever. Sigma over pi j momentum r to the 12 minus sigma j prime sigma over pi j r 6. Okay, where pi j r is the distance between reference atoms 1, or i, and any other atom j expressed in terms of the nearest neighbor distance r. The factor one half um, we do because we don't want to count uh, each pair of atoms twice, right? Because we can say one to two, that's the same distance as two to one. That's how we have the one half. Okay, um, the summations in 11 have been evaluated. And for the, so for FCC, we have J summing PIJ to the negative 12 is interesting, 12.13188. And then for PIJ to the negative 6, 14.45392. Okay, so I guess they did it for a unit cell, is my understanding. Um, there are 12 nearest neighbor sites in the FCC structure, and we see that the series are rapidly converging and have values not far from 12. I agree. Uh, the nearest neighbors contribute most of the interaction energy of the inert gas crystals and the corresponding sums for, I guess, HCP, hexagonal close packed, uh, is really, really, really similar. <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, I guess because they have a similar packing factor, I think. All right. So if you take the total energy from 11, this equation right here, also this one right here, um, and we get... We want to find equilibrium, right? So where the potential is at a minimum. So we want du tot over dr to be zero. So we find a minimum or maximum, I guess, but we're going to find a minimum. Uh, equals negative 2 and e. So we're just taking the derivative and we're just putting in the numbers 12 times 12.13, 12, 12 over r to the 13 minus 6 times 14.45. We're just taking the simple derivative. That's why you get the r over 7 and then the 6 down there. So what we find out then is r naught over sigma is equal to 1.09. And OK, the equilibrium value of r naught is given by requiring that the u naught. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we find the equivalent value for r, basically. And we find that. Is the same for all elements within an FCC structure. So we want the ratio of the equilibrium distance and sigma to be 1.09. So for different elements and stuff, neon has 1.14, argon 1.11, krypton 1.10, xenon 1.09. And the agreement with 14 is remarkable. Oh, yeah, yeah, my bad. Uh, in other words, we're saying that for FCC, we should get this value of 1.09. And here we see that we basically do. What's happening, what I'm assuming is happening, uh, so xenon is the furthest down on the periodic table of elements. Um, so it's going to be, yeah, because we see a downward trend. So it has the most, uh, like, pure only Van der Waal interactions in the stuff we were talking about before. And that's why it's the closest in agreement. And as you get lower and lower, you can probably get some maybe other interactions that happen when you have less electrons. Okay, so... Oh, I guess can be okay. It even goes over it. Can be explained by zero point quantum effect for the lighter atoms. Okay, nice. All right, now back to that um, concept we're talking about: cohesive energy. Cohesive energy, right? Which is kind of the energy to take one atom, like let's bond together and move it to infinity, basically. So we can take our potential energy total of R, which is two and epsilon of 12.13 times sigma over r to the 12 minus 14.45. This is for FCC. Uh, sigma over r to the 6. Okay. And then we know when r is equal to r naught, our equilibrium, we get 2.15 times 
four and epsilon like that. How do we get 2.15, right? Well, we know this ratio over here is 1.09 because we have sigma over R naught, right? Or I guess one over 1.019, sorry. Same thing though. This is the same for all inert gases. So the, the calculated cohesive energy when the atoms are at rest. So quantum mechanical corrections act to reduce the binding uh, by 28 to 10 and 6 and 4% of equation 16 for neon, argon, krypton, xenon, perfect. So what we see, Ray, is quantum mechanical corrections uh, reduce the binding a lot more for neon, and then as you get heavier and heavier and heavier, it reduces it less. Okay, nice. So the heavier the atom, the smaller the quantum correction. Smaller the quantum correction, right? Quantum, small stuff. We can understand the origin of the quantum correction by consideration of a simple model in which an atom is confined by fixed boundaries. The particle has the quantum wavelength lambda, where lambda is defined by the boundaries, and the particle has kinetic energy. Okay, so we have p squared over 2m is our kinetic energy, which is h over lambda squared divided by 2m. Uh, using the de Broglie relationship, that p equals h over lambda. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, for the connection between the momentum and the wavelength of the particle, on the model, the zero point correction to the energy is inversely proportional to the mass. That makes sense, over to him. Uh, so in the final calculated cohesive energies agree with the experimental values of table four within one to 7%. Nice. Okay, so one consequence of this quantum kinetic energy is that a crystal of the isotope neon 20 is observed to have a larger lattice constant than the crystal of neon 22, right? So we have more neutrons in there, which uh, make it heavier. So then um, it's gonna, shrink the lattice constant is why I'm understanding. Yeah, kinetic energy is reduced by expansion, so then the observed lattice constants uh, are 4.46 and then 4.559. So as you get larger, you get a more densely packed. Okay, nice. So ionic crystals are made up of positive and negative. Okay, nice. So now we're gonna transition into ionic crystals, which you might know as like ionic bonds, right? some of the strongest bonds we can have. So ionic crystals are made up of positive and negative ions, and the ionic bond between results from the electrostatic interaction, right? We have a positive and minus connected together. So two common crystal structures found for ionic crystals, the sodium chloride, so salt, and the cesium chloride structures were shown in chapter one earlier. Um, electron configuration of all ions of a simple ionic correspond to closed electron shells as in inert gas atoms. In other words, when we take like NaCl, NaCl, this is like a plus, this is like one minus, so then they form together, right? To make a full shell. So the single charge ions of configuration, so lithium is a 1s2, and fluoride is a 1s2s2, 2s2, 2p6. Um, so it's a single minus, and then lithium is a single plus. Okay, nice. So. We expect that the charge distributions on each ion in an ionic crystal have approximate spherical symmetry with some distortions near the region of contact with the neighboring atoms. This, and we can confirm this by X-ray studies of the electron distributions, figure seven. Okay, let's look at figure seven for a second. So electron density distribution in the base plane of salt after X-ray studies by some dude. Okay, nice. So we see it's basically spherical and then we get kind of like some distortions where the bonds are. Okay. Um, a quick estimate uh, suggests that we are not misguided and look at the electrostatic energy. So the distance between a positive ion and the nearest negative ion in crystalline sodium chloride is 2.81 times 10 to the 8 centimeters. And the attractive coulomb part of the potential energy of the two ions by themselves is 5.1 eV, just for doing kqq over r squared. So this value may be compared with the experimental values of 7.9 eV, per molecular unit for the lattice energy of salt with respect to separated Na and um, Cl ions, chlorine, chlorine. So we're gonna calculate the energy more closely. So electrostatic or Madelung energy. So long range interaction between ions with charge, right, is just the Q squared over R, the Coulomb, right? Um, between ions of the same charge. So the ions arrange themselves in whatever crystal structure gives the strongest interaction compatible with the repulsive interaction at short distances between ion cores. 
So the repulsive interaction between ions with inert gas configurations are similar to those with between inert gas atoms. So the Van der Waals part of the attractive interaction ionic crystals basically makes a very small contribution to the cohesive energy in ionic crystals by an order of one or two percent. So the main contribution is the ionic, is the electrostatic or the Madelung energy, right? Uh, because like a plus and a minus is gonna be a lot stronger than like the Van der Waals interaction, right? As we saw earlier, we had a scale as like one over R to the six, right? Okay, so electron affinity is positive for a stable negative ion. Okay, so basically if U I J is the interaction energy between ions I and J, we can define um, all the interactions involving a single ion I as the sum over J of U I J, um, where the summation includes ions except J not equal to I. Okay, so we suppose that U I J may be written as the sum of the central field repulsive potential of the form lambda E to the negative R over rho, where lambda and rho are <coughs> empirical parameters and a Coulomb potential of just Q squared over R. So in CGS, where we just ignore um, constants, lambda E to the negative R I J divided by rho plus or minus Q squared over R I J. So these are our two, this is like our total energy. Um, so the plus sign is for like charges, and the minus sign is for unlike charges, right? Otherwise, because it's just QQ. Um, okay, yeah, so they're just making a note that we're doing in the CGS units. Um, instead of SI units because we don't want to carry all those constants. Okay, so the repulsive term describes the fact that each ion resists overlap with the electron distribution of the neighboring ions. And we treat the strength of lambda in the range of rho as constants to be determined from observed values of the lattice constant and compressibility. So we have used the exponential form of the empirical, empirical repulsive potential rather than the R to the negative 12 form used for inert gases. And we do this because it gives us a better representation of the repulsive interaction so for the ions, we do not have gas phase data available to permit the independent determination of lambda and rho. And we note that rho is a measure of the range of the repulsive interaction. So when R equals rho, the repulsive interaction is reduced to like e to the negative one uh, at the value at R equals zero. So in the salt structure, the value of UI does not depend on whether the reference ion is positive or negative. And then the sum in 17, this one right here, uh, can be arranged to converge rapidly, so that's value does not depend on the site of the reference ion on the crystal, as long as it's not near the surface. So basically, after a certain point, right, um, you only need a certain amount of atoms before it doesn't change much. So you kind of you can kind of do it like if you have a big crystal like this, minus plus, you know, dot dot dot. If it like extends all the way out here, any one of these atoms will kind of give you a similar result, as long as it's not next to the surface. Okay. Um, we neglect surface effects and write the total lattice energy of a crystal composed of n molecules or two n ions as just multiplying the two u total equals n ui where we use n rather than 2n because we must count each pair of interactions only once in other words each bond only once so this is where we're counting we're counting the bonds basically um, it's convenient to gain um <coughs> It's convenient again to introduce quantities such as Pij such that Rij equals Pij big R, where R is the nearest neighbor separation in the crystal. So if we include the repulsive interaction only among nearest neighbors, we have, again in these units, I'm just gonna screenshot this and talk over it. Um, we have our exact same interaction over here, which is for nearest neighbors, we have this special one over here, because we'd include this form right here, and then otherwise, if it's a bit farther away, we just, do, we just default to the Coulomb. Um, okay. And then we basically get the total energy then is, oh, yeah. sorry, um, NUI, which is Z lambda E to the negative R over P rho uh, minus alpha Q squared over R, where Z is the number of nearest neighbors of any ion, so depending on the structure. And then alpha is the Madelung constant. And yeah, okay. The value, blah, blah, blah. 
Okay, so basically the value of the Babylon country, uh, constant um, is very important for the theory of ionic crystals, and we're going to discuss how to calculate it next. Um, so at the equilibrium separation, right, so you basically want to find du, again, total, divided by dr to find r naught equals zero. We get um, n dui over dr is equal to negative n z lambda over rho e to the negative r divided by rho, just by taking the derivative, plus n alpha q squared over r squared is equal to zero. In other words, um, r naught squared e to the negative r naught over rho is equal to rho alpha q squared divided by z lambda. So basically this tells us that r naught uh, depends on obviously rho and lambda of the repulsive interaction. So for, okay, whatever. For standard units, you can change back to it by putting in the correct value for q squared, which is q squared divided by four pi epsilon naught. Okay, so then the total lattice energy of the crystal of two n ions, um, or n molecules, uh, may be written as u total equals negative n alpha q squared over r naught. Again, in CGS, one minus rho over r naught, or if you wanted to turn this into SI units, you just divide the factor in front divided by four pi epsilon naught. Okay, and then this term, n alpha q squared over r naught, right here, is the Madelung energy. <sighs> and we're going to find that rho is of the order of 0.1 r naught, so the repulsive interaction has a very short range, right? Because we're getting basically 1 minus 0.1, which is basically just the same thing, right? All right. So, okay. Lines, faltering signs, distance r between ions. Okay, so let's now we want to evaluate this Madelung constant, right? Madelung, I spelled it wrong, Lung constant evaluation. Let me take a sip of my tea. Okay, so remember, um, it's alpha. And alpha is the sum over j of plus or minus pij. Okay. Uh, for so for twenty, twenty was um, this total energy, right? In order for this to be stable, right? We need this one right here to be negative. Well, I guess positive. So you subtract a positive, but you need to subtract a positive. So we basically need alpha to be positive. So if we take the reference ion as a negative charge, the plus sign will apply to positive ions and then minus signs to negative ions. Okay, so an equivalent definition is alpha over R is equal to, remember because P is just um, R times X or whatever, so R, uh, J I plus minus over R J where Rj is the distance of the jth ion from the reference ion, and R is the nearest neighbor different distance. So the value given by, basically if you look at this line, R, this is R right here, and then Rij could be, draw, could be this, 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 et cetera. Okay. Um, so, So as an example, we compute the Madelung constant for the infinite line. So we're going to do it for this line right here. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus. So we get alpha over R is equal to 2 times 1 over R minus, so we alternate, 1 over 2R plus 1 over 3R minus 1 over 4R plus 1 over 5R dot, 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 right? Or alpha is equal to 2. 1 minus 1 half, well this is like a sum, right? Plus 1 third minus 1 fourth plus, and you might think it looks familiar, and that's because um, we can expand, the expansion of ln 1 plus x is 
x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 minus x fourth over 4 dot 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 and then we can make x1 right so we basically get alpha is equal to 2 ln 2 right boom so that's for that's for a 1d chain right okay and then uh Blah blah blah. So energy per molecule of a potassium chloride crystal shows the Madelung Coulomb and repulsive contributions. Okay, great. Uh, basically, you know, one D that was that wasn't too bad, right? We could kind of tell that series was just log, natural log. But three D it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, it's not possible to write down the successive terms by casual inspection. And basically, the series will not converge unless the successive terms in the series are arranged that the contributions from positive and negative terms nearly cancel. Um, and here are some typical values of the actual Madelung constants um, for a couple things. Sodium chloride, cesium chloride, and zinc blend cubic, I guess. <laughs> um, okay. So... Nice. All right, here's a table, I guess, of the properties of these alkali halide crystals with the salt structure, which is just like the normal cubic ionic structure, right? Okay, um, we see the nearest neighbor distance here. It's increasing as we go down, right? And as it increases, right, the repulsive energy also increases. Um, so yeah. We see the lattice energy compared to free ions decreases all right <clears throat> so I think we'll talk about this in Kobele. all right that was oh, the ionic case right how about the covalent case so the covalent bond is the classical electron pair or homopolar bond of chemistry basically if you took ochem you'll know about it it's a strong bond, and the bond between two carbon atoms and diamond with respect to separated neutral atoms is comparable with the bond strength in ionic crystals. So, basically, covalent is nothing to scoff at. Um, it's usually formed from two electrons, one from each atom participating in the bond, and the electrons forming the bond tend to be partial, partly localized in the region between the two atoms joined by the bond. The spins of the two electrons in the bond are anti-parallel, Right, so that means you can have them in the same state. You spin up and spin down. Um, and the covalent bond has strong directional properties, figure 11. So if you look at figure 11, right, we see that we can kind of get a directionality between the two germanium atoms, right? We kind of see how we have this, this strong center stuff over here and then weaker away. Okay. <clears throat> so, all right. The, thus carbon, silicon, and germanium have the diamond structure. Right, with atoms joined to four nearest neighbors at tetrahedral angles, even though this arrangement gives a low filling space of 0.34, oh wow, of the available space, compared with 0.74 of the closed pack structure, the tetrahedral bond allows only four nearest neighbors, whereas a closed pack structure has 12. So we should not overemphasize the similarity of the bonding of carbon and silicon. Carbon gives biology, but silicon gives geology and semiconductor technology. <clears throat> They just have similar bonding, so they're trying to say. So then the binding of the molecular of molecular hydrogen is a simple example of a covalent bond, right? So H2. Um, the strongest binding, figure 12, occurs when the spins of the two electrons are anti-parallel. This should make sense, right? Because then they're in the same state, and they're in the lowest state possible, so equilibrium, right? And um, the binding depends on the relative spin rotation, not because there are strong magnetic dipole forces between the spins, but okay, yeah, because the Pauli principle modifies the distribution of charge according to spin orientation. Basically, it's in the lowest possible potential because you're in the lowest energy state, right? So in this spin-dependent Coulomb energy is called the exchange interaction. So if you look here, right, we see we have uh, the up-up has a much higher energy than the up-down. So we have the symmetric and then the anti-symmetric, uh, I guess, parallel stable state and then non-stable state my bad but anyways 
Um, and then the N is the classical calculation with free atom charge densities. And then A is if you have parallel, and S is anti-parallel, which I guess I said it backwards, but it's what we expect, right, it to stay in. Okay, so the Pauli principle gives a strong repulsive interaction between atoms with filled shells. If the shells are not filled, the electron overlap can be um, accommodated without excitation of electrons to high energy states, and the bond will be shorter. So let's compare the bond length to angstroms of Cl2 with the interatomic distance uh, 3.76 of argon and solid argon. And we can compare the cohesive energies given in table one of Cl2 and uh, argon. So before I go to table one, let's keep reading this. It's five electrons in 3p shell, and argon atom has six fill in the shell. So the repulsive interaction is stronger in argon than in chlorine. Okay, I guess we don't need to go there. We'll just take their word for it. All right, so the elements of carbon, silicon, and germanium lack four electrons with respect to filled shells, and thus these elements basically can have an interactive um, interaction associated with charge overlap. So basically, they're all lacking four, right? So if they bond with themselves, they get a filled shell, right? They can form a tetrahedral system of covalent bonds, um, right? So imagine homeboy carbon over here. He, he needs four electrons. He shares with one carbon shares with one carbon, shares with one carbon, shares with one carbon. And then that's just for like 2D, if you wanna make it 3D, you have to make kind of the diamond structure, right? Because <clears throat> the diamond structure has four nearest neighbors. Okay, so um, basically to form a tetrahedral system of covalent bonds, a carbon atom must first be promoted to the electron configuration of 1S, 2S, 2P3. Thus the promotion from ground state requires four EV, an amount more than regained when the bonds are formed. Okay. Nice. So I guess we'll talk about this later probably. So this is a continuous range of crystals in the ionic and covalent limits. It's often important to estimate the extent of a given bond is ionic or covalent. So a semi-empirical theory of the fractional ionic. Okay, so they're saying um, <clears throat> a fractional ionic basically means how much of the bonds are like purely ionic versus covalent. And we see in silicon, it's purely covalent germanium purely covalent um what do they change over here oh because these are different crystals okay and then as you start to kind of change their properties by bonding with not itself um like silicon and carbon right they have different um like sizes radii and stuff like that so um you're gonna get some ionic bonding there as well it's so basically as you make it less and less pure, you get more um, ionic bonds. <clears throat> okay, so metals. We know metals, we love metals. Metals help us um, make our world run, right? Steel, industrial revolution, et cetera, et cetera. So metals are basically high electron conductivity uh, and a large number of electrons in metal are free to move about, usually one or two per atom. We get kind of a sea of electrons to quote like I don't know, rudimentary physics. Um, so the electrons that can move are called conduction electrons, and the valence electrons of the atom become the conduction electrons of the metal. So in some metals, the interaction of the ion cores, the conduction electrons always make a large contribution to the binding energy, but the characteristic feature of metallic binding is the lowering of the energy of the valence electrons in the metal as compared to the free atom. So basically, when they can move around freely, you get a lower energy state, so it's more... Um, energetically favorable. <clears throat> so, the binding energy of alkali metal crystals is considerably less than that of the alkali halide crystal, um, and the bond formed by a conduction electron is not very strong, so it's weaker, basically. The interatomic distances are also relatively large in alkali metals because the kinetic energy of the conduction electrons is lower at large interatomic distances, and this leads to weak binding. So basically, metals tend to crystallize in relatively closed back structures, so HCP, FCC, BCC, this is why stuff like iron and all these other metals and stuff are uh, FCC or BCC. So in some of these other uh, closely related structures and not in loosely packed structures such as diamond. Okay, basically they need to be closer together so you can get those better conduction bands. So in the transition metals, there's an additional binding from inner electron shells. So transition metals and metals immediately follow them in the periodic table have large D electron shells and are characterized by high binding energy. Okay, nice. So. The hydrogen difluoride ion is stabilized by a hydrogen bond. Okay, 
probably should look at this one. Okay. So I guess next is hydrogen bonds. I guess I didn't really write anything for metals, but we're just talking empirically right now, I think. Okay, so because neutral hydrogen has only one electron, right, it should form a covalent bond with only one other atom, right? So we should be getting like H with H basically, or whatever else is like one free valence electron. Um, that's a hydrogen bond. Um, and it has a bond energy uh, of 0.1 EV. So, oh, no, no, no. It's saying that this is what should happen, right? But the hydrogen bond is like, sometimes under certain conditions, a single atom of hydrogen is attracted by a rather strong force to two atoms, two atoms, uh, forming a hydrogen bond between them with a bond energy of the order of 0.1 EV. And it's believed that the hydrogen bond is largely ionic in character, being formed only between the most electronegative atoms, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Nitrogen, I think. Yeah, nitrogen. <clears throat> in the extreme ionic form of the hydrogen bond, the hydrogen atom loses its electron to another atom in the molecule, and the bare proton forms the hydrogen bond. So you basically have like, H is just a single plus, and you have a minus boy over here, a minus boy over here, and you get like that, I think. Um, okay. And then the atoms adjacent to the proton are so close, so they're super close, oops, like that. Uh, thus, the hydrogen bond connects only two atoms. Figure 13, let's make sure I'm drawing right stuff. We look at figure 13. Yeah, yeah, see, it just goes directly in the middle of the two. Okay, nice. Um, the hydrogen bond is an important part of the interaction between water molecules and is responsible with the electrostatic interaction of the electric dipole moments for the striking physical properties of water and ice, how ice is less dense than water. Uh, it is important in certain fer ferroelectric crystals, ooh, very cool, and in DNA. Okay, a lot of words, but I guess that's cool. So hydrogen can basically give up its electron and become like a chilling proton. Okay. So distances between, so atomic radii. Atomic radii is important. I did briefly mention it earlier for reasons for metals. Um, but basically, um, we can measure them very rapidly using XRD, X-ray diffraction, which is a characterization technique. Basically, you shoot X-rays at uh, crystals and stuff, or you can do powder diffraction. Um, and using Bragg's Law or stuff like that, you can reconstruct the spacing between atoms. So, can we say that the observed distance between atoms may be assigned partly to atom A and partly to atom B? And can a definite meaning be assigned to the radius of an atom or an ion, irrespective of the nature and composition of the crystal? Okay. So, basically, we can't exactly say an atom is just a solid thing with a certain radius, right? Um, because the charge distribution around an atom is not like a sphere. It's not a perfect sphere that says, okay, all the electrons are chilling up to right here. Um, nonetheless, the concept of an atomic radius is fruitful in predicting the interatomic spacing. So we can model it kind of like this to kind of get how big each atom is. And then, like, for example, if we wanted to, like, make an FCC structure or something like that, you can have it like that. And then so forth. And you want to see, like, when they kind of touch, basically, how big they would be. Um, <clears throat> And the existence and probable lattice constants of phases that have not yet been synthesized can be predicted from the additive properties of the atomic radii. So it's, it's basically just a useful concept. So the electron configuration of the cons constituent atoms often can be inferred by a comparison of measured and predicted values of the lattice constants. So to make predictions of lattice constants, it's convenient to assign uh, table nine sets of self-consistent radii to various types of bonds. One set for ionic crystals, with the constituents ion six coordinated and inert closed gas shell configurations, and another set for the ions in tetrahedrally coordinated structures, and another set for 12 coordinated uh, closed packed metals. So we'll look at table nine. Um, radii for tetrahedral, radii for ions in 12 coordinated. Okay, so we basically see that like they have different values depending on how they're gonna be oriented. Okay, which should make sense, right? Because then they have different bonds and so forth. All right. Oh, actually, and then we should see, right, for example, like, where's iron? Iron, right, only makes, like, FCC closed packed, so it gets 12 coordinated metals. We don't have, really, iron 
for the other two. We see a lot of that for the metals, right? Versus like uh, magnesium, right, can be all three. So I'm going to have a bunch of different arrangements. Okay. Um, so the predicted self-consistent radii of the cation sodium plus and the anion F minus, as given in table 9, would lead to 0.97 angstrom plus 1.36. You can just add them for the interatomic separation of the crystal NAF as compared to the observed 2.32. So basically, this R value is very useful because um, we can just add the two to basically get the net effect. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. So the interatomic distance between carbon atoms and diamond is 1.54 angstroms. One half of this is 0.77 angstroms. And, okay. And silicon, which has the same crystal structure, one half. Oh, oh, they're talking about, okay. That makes sense. So basically we had a good agreement with the sodium fluoride at 2.32. And it's better if we assumed that they were neutral, which would lead to 2.58 from the other values in the table. Um, and the latter value is one half N uh, distance in the metallic interatomic distance in gaseous F2. So half the distance basically between the two. And for carbon, we get 0.77. And silicon, which has the same structure, one half the interatomic distance is 1.17 angstroms. So in silicon carbon, each atom is surrounded by four atoms of the opposite kind. So I have basically like a silicon here, and then I get one carbon, one carbon, one carbon, one carbon, and then each carbon is connected to four silicons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So we have like, I don't know, SI, 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 and then I don't know, I think that, that might bond there, this might bond there, like that, like that, something like that. But it's a 3D structure, so it's a bit more complicated. Okay. And if we add the carbon and uh, silicon radii just given, we predict 1.94 for the length of this bond, right? which is in fair agreement with the 1.89 observed for the bond length. And this is the kind of agreement, so a few percent off, that we'll be using for atomic radii. Okay, so ionic crystal radii for ionic bonds. That was for um, like the diamond structure atoms. Now, ionic crystal, right, um, is for the six-fold coordination. So the ionic radii can be used in conjunction with table 10. So the interatomic distance D is represented by Dn is equal to Rc plus Ra uh, plus delta N, where Ra and Rc are the standard radii of the cation and anion, so like f uh, sodium and chloride. Um, and delta N is a correction for coordination number. So if we look at uh, the delta N for the different corrections for coordination numbers, we see how it varies. Nice. So let's consider um, barium, titanium, uh, oxide, I guess? Is that an oxide? O3 is oxide? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Uh, with a lattice constant of 4.004 .004 angstroms at room temperature. So each barium 2 plus ion has 12 nearest um, oxygen 2 minus ions. The coordination number is 12, and the correction of 12 applies, so 0.19. Okay. Um, so if we suppose that the structure is determined by barium O contacts, or barium oxide, I'm dumb. Uh, we have, so D12, right, is 1.35 for the value for barium, 1.4 the value for oxygen, plus 0.9 the correction is 2.94 angstroms, or the last constant is 4.16 angstroms. If titanium oxide, I don't know, oxygen contacts determines the structure, we have D6, so 0.68 plus 1.4, uh, which equals 2.08 or alpha is 4.16. Uh, how do they get 2.94 to 4.16? Don't you add the delta? Mm, that is not making much sense. We have 1.35 plus 1.4 is 2.94. The 
And shouldn't you double that? Huh. Interesting. Okay. Then we, I guess we get the actual lattice constant is somewhat smaller than the estimates and may perhaps suggest the bonding is not purely ionic, but partially covalent. So that's what the difference is between the estimated purely ionic case and then what happens in reality, since they're dealing with atoms of different sizes. Huh. Okay. Not too sure how they went from here to here. See, this one right here makes sense. You just double it, right? That's what they're talking about, the one half N. But 2.94, or A is 4.16. We we included the correction, so it should be fine. Maybe that was just for this. Huh. Oh, I guess probably. Oh, I guess probably they're telling us is that this is what we get expected, so we should be doubling this, and then this is what they actually got. So for barium oxide, um, it's actually a lot smaller than double two point nine four. That's probably what it is. Okay, nice. All right. So the thing is we can strain these materials, right? And we can kind of get view of like the elastic properties of material, like, like metal, right? You can bend certain metals. So we can do an analysis of elastic strain. So let's consider the elastic properties of a crystal viewed as a homogeneous continuous medium rather than as a periodic array of atoms. So the continuum approximation is usually valid for elastic waves of wavelengths lambda longer than 10 to the minus six centimeters, which means for frequencies below 10 to 11 or 10 to the 12 Hertz. So some of the material below looks complicated because of the unavoidability multiplicity of the subscripts of the symbols, but basically basic physics principles are simple. We're gonna use Hooke's law and Newton's second law, F equals MA. So Hooke's law, right, states that an elastic solid, the strain is directly proportional to the stress right, uh, negative kx. So the law applies to small strain only. We say that we're in the nonlinear region when the strains are so large, the Hooke's law is no longer satisfied. So we specify the strain and the components of, you know, all the directions, exx, eyy, ezz, exy, eyz, ezx, which are defined below. Uh, and we're gonna treat infinitesimal strains only, so we shall not distinguish in our notation between isothermal, constant temperature, and adiabatic, constant entropy deformations. The small difference between isothermal and adiabatic are not really of importance at room temperature and below. So let's imagine that the three orthogonal vectors, x, y, z of unit length are embedded securely in an unstrained solid as shown in figure 14. Boom, here are x, y, and z. They're just in a solid, chilling. Um, and a uniform deformation, each primitive cell of the crystal is deformed in the same way. So we can basically write these new axes, x prime, y prime, z prime, uh, using the strain values we found. So x prime, right, x prime moved this way, it's one plus the strain in the xx direction, plus the xy, and plus the xz for each of the varying components. And we just transform each of the um, axes to get the net effect of how it is. So you can imagine we have like a one atom here, 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 and then they moved here, here, and here. Okay, so the coefficients epsilon, alpha, beta define the deformation and are dimensionless and have values of much, much less than one if the strain is small. So in this case, this is obviously an exaggeration, um, but anyways, the original axes were of unit length and the new axes will not necessarily be of unit length. So if we did, you know, x, y, z as actual unit vectors, X prime, Y prime, and Z prime are no longer unit vectors because when you dot it with itself, right, you get the one comes out and you get all these strain extra values, which, you know, in the limit that these are all very small, uh, it goes to one, right? But okay, so therefore, X prime, right, is approximately one plus epsilon XX plus dot, dot, dot where the fractional changes of length x hat, y hat, and z hat are uh, epsilon xx, epsilon yy, epsilon zz, right? Because we care about the first order right here because when you square something small, it gets very small. <laughs> okay, so a lot of words, but anyways, what is the effect of the deformation um, 26? So these basically, um, 
uh, like vector changes. Um, on an atom originally at R equals X, Y, Z, right? So we have an atom that's chilling at this point, X given by X, Y, and Z. Uh, and the origin is taken at some other atom. So if the deformation is uniform, then after deformation, the point will be at the position R prime is X, X prime plus Y, Y prime plus Z, Z prime. This is obviously correct if we choose the X axis such that R equals X, X, then R prime equals X, X prime by the definition of X prime, right? We can just substitute the two. Okay, um, so the displacement R of the deformation, we can define as just R prime minus R, right? That's just what you do. So if I have R vector over here, and then I have uh, R prime, like that, the dis oh, sorry, R prime like that, and the display then the difference is R, right? R prime, okay. <clears throat> so that's gonna be X, x prime minus x hat plus y y prime minus y hat plus z z prime minus z hat okay so when we plug in our deformation stuff we get r is equal to i guess all the bolded ones should have arrows above them but i'm lazy so we get x strain and the xx plus y strain in the yx plus z strain in the zx all for the x hat direction so we're just plugging in what the difference in x prime is right because if we go over here we're subtracting away this one times the x thing because we're doing x prime minus x hat so that goes away uh and then i won't write the rest down you can just see it here i'll screenshot it to highlight it but notice that there's no of like notice that it's just the strain components for each one basically because the one plus uh epsilon xx x hat direction we're doing x prime minus x hat so then the one goes away and that's why we're just left with these components okay um we can write this in a more general form if we introduce u v and w such that this right here gets simpl simplified to r of r equals u r of x hat plus v r of y hat plus w r of z hat. Um, if the deformation is non-uniform, we have to relate u, v, and w to local strains. So we take the origin of r to the, close to the region of interest. Then comparison of 28, 28 is this one right here, uh, and 29 right here. Uh, we can tailor expand, right? We're assuming it's zero. We can say of R using R of zero is zero, uh, such that X and the epsilon XX direction is approximately X del U del X. And then same thing for Y, epsilon YX is approximately Y del U del Y, etc. The partials for each individual one, right? Okay. So it's, it is usual to work with coefficients E, A, B, I don't think that's a Greek letter, I think it's just E, uh, rather than epsilon alpha beta, um, or alpha beta. Uh, we define the strain components simply as the partials for the relative directions, right? Where we, it's just the Taylor expansion of it, right? <clears throat> so um, the other strain components are defined in terms of the change in angle between the axes, so using 26. So we have, for the non-simple ones, for like E, X, Y, is defined as X prime dotted into Y prime, which is approximately epsilon Y, X, plus epsilon X, Y, which is just the partial of the two summed, right? So that's it, that's a U, that's a V, okay? So, Hopefully that makes sense. So, okay. Um, which basically the way you can kind of think about it is YX means you care about the X direction, right? Um, but it was deformed, like your X axis was deformed in the Y direction. So you take the partial of X with respect to Y. That's what it's DU, DY. Because remember, U refers to X, V refers to Y. W refers to Z. So um, I guess I can screenshot these just because 
these are the actual relations very nice um, and we can replace these kind of approximate signs by equal signs if we neglect terms of order strain squared right because a small number squared is an even smaller number so we don't care about it so the six dimensionless coefficients um, are also related by the fact that e alpha beta is the same thing as e beta alpha because it just relates the two directions right okay so dilation what is dilation it's gonna be a long video i'm pretty sure <laughs> sorry let me get a little like stretching i think we're doing pretty good i think we're over halfway through it though i hope <laughs> um but okay so dilation so the fractional increase of a volume associated with a deformation is called dilation so the dilation is negative for hydrostatic pressure. So the unit cube of edges x hat, y hat, z hat has a volume after deformation of, well, how do we find the volume of something? We take the dot product and cross it with a third, right? So v prime is x prime dotted y prime, normally put this in parentheses, cross z hat, z hat, right? That's the volume. So easiest way to do this, right? is you can rewrite this as just the determinant of x, y, and z above. So it's the determinant of x, y, z, like that, which, you know, if I write it out, is 1, oh, crap, 1 plus xx, xy, xz, and then we have, uh, I guess I can just look, epsilon yx, 1 plus epsilon yy, Epsilon YZ, and then we have Epsilon ZX, Epsilon ZY, 1 plus ZZ, right? Yeah, nice. Like that. Which, if we take the dot, if we take the product rate, um, we can basically approximate it, right? Because we don't care about the squared terms. So we basically get 1 plus EXX plus EYY plus EZZ. Right, because the thing that matters, right, take the determinant of this, it's this cross with this, so we don't care about the square terms, and so forth. So, yeah, so we can get the dilation, delta, is defined as V prime minus V over V. So what is kind of the fractional difference between the two, which is approximately then, the one just goes away. Right, because... Um, yeah, the, the, if you take the volume, right, of something of unit one with unit one, the volume is just equal to one, right? Because it's, you're basically doing unit vector dot other unit vector, so it has a length of one, cross other vector of length one, so you get one again. Nice. Okay. So, stress components. Just components. So what I mean here, by the way, is just x hat dot y hat is like x y cosine theta. This is you know this will give you a one. This is one times one times one is one, and then one cross. Uh, you know, basically like one cross whatever it's called. Uh, one again. So one sine theta is just one times one, which is one. Okay. Anyways, stress components. So Right, we're dealing in three dimensions, so we're gonna have nine stress components. Uh, in the x, y, z direction, then we have, I guess, they, they do it weird. I guess they're doing it x in the x compression, x in the y direction, x in the z direction, and then you have this three times, right? Because you have y in the x direction, y in the y direction, and you have y in the z direction, then you have z in the x direction, z in the y direction, z in the z direction. So the capital letter indicates the direction of the force. So these are on the X, these are on the Y, these are on the Z. And then uh, the subscript indicates the normal to which, to the plane to which the force is applied. Nice. So in figure 15, we basically showing all these things. So we have uh, XX, XY, XZ. So showing you which plane. So over here, right, we have the X in the X direction. Here we have the X in the Y direction and so forth. So 
for a body and stack equilibrium, yx has to equal xy, uh, right? Because xy is the direction of x and it's in the y, so then these two things have to equal each other right here. Like these two things have to equal but opposite in order to get the values, and the same with these. Okay. So, and then the total torque is also zero if yx equals xy. So if yx equals xy, right, and these two things cancel out and you don't rotate at all. So it doesn't rotate this way or this way. Okay, uh, what is this? The stress component xx represents a force applied in the x direction to a unit area of plane whose normal lies in the x direction. So here, the normal of x, right, is this plane that looks like this, and then the force in the x direction is this. So that's what xx means. So a little thing means plane, big thing means axis, like direction of the force. Okay, so the number of independent stress components is reduced from nine to six by applying to an elementary cube as in figure 16, the, con the condition that the angular acceleration must have vanished. In other words, torque is zero, so alpha is zero. Um, so we get to then that, we get the component that yz equals zy, so just flip the two, and then zx equals xz, and then xy equals yx, because we're saying it's not gonna be rotating. So stress components have the dimension of force per unit area, or energy per unit volume. Force per unit area, F over A, that's like pressure. Uh, oh, yes, it is pressure. Uh, so the strain components are ratios of lengths and are dimensionless. Nice. Okay. Wow, that's a lot of... I'm definitely not writing all this out, but I can screenshot it. So elastic compliance and stiffness constants. So Hooke's law states that for sufficiently small deformations, the strain is directly proportional to the stress. So the strain components are linear functions of the stress components. So we can write these out as shown, which I'm not going to do because it's, it's a lot of writing, um, where our strain components, right, and stress components uh, form a linear combination to get basically the EXX, EYY, and all that stuff. So we kind of see the relationship between these two, right, where the S and C are just the constants for the different ones. So the S11, S12 are the elastic compliance constants, and then the C11, C12 are the elastic stiffness constants. Or from your engineering classes, the moduli of elasticity. So um, the S's have dimensions of area per force, volume per energy, and the C's have force per area. Okay, so pressure and I guess pressure to the negative one. I don't know, what is the inverse of pressure? Out of curiosity. What is the inverse of pressure? Huh? That's not true. Okay, whatever. I guess P of negative one. It's fine. Okay. So, elastic energy density. So basically, Hooke's Law is just telling us we can make linear combinations of them, right? Because they're linear functions. All right, so elastic energy density. So uh, 36 constants, so all of these, <laughs> um, uh, may be reduced in number by several considerations. So that's a lot of things to remember. So let's see what we can do to basically reduce them. So the elastic energy density u is a quadratic function, right? One half kx squared for normal stuff um, of the strains and the approximation of Hooke's law, the energy for a stretch springs, we can write u is equal to one half, sum over lambda equals one to the six, sum over mu equals one to the six. Why is there six? Well, there's six strain considerations, right? Because we said that the torque has to be zero. Uh, C tilde lambda mu, E lambda E mu, uh, where the indices one through six are defined as xx, yy, zz, and then yz, zx, xy. And then the Cs, Tildes are related to the C's of from before, for, uh, below. So we'll see. Uh, the stress component are found. Components are found from the derivative of U with respect to the associated strain component. This result follows from the definition of potential energy. So let's consider the stress x in the x, x direction of the x plane applied to one face of a unit cube. The opposite face being held at rest. 
this is equal to partial u del e x x, which is defined as del u del e1, which is equal to c tilde 1 1 e1 plus 1 half sum over beta equals 2, so the rest of them, to 6 of c1 beta plus c beta 1 e beta. And we note that the only combination uh, of this stuff right here that enters the stress strain relations, uh, so only these combinations enter it, where we have alpha and beta and then beta and alpha, it follows that the elastic stiffness constants then have to be symmetrical, such that C of alpha beta has to equal one half C tilde of alpha beta plus C of beta alpha, which is just C of beta alpha. In other words, that was a lot of fancy math to say that you can swap the indices, it's the same thing. So then therefore the 36 elastic stiffness constants are reduced to 21, right? Since we get rid of the ones that have different indices. Okay, nice. So elastic stiffness constants of cubic crystals. So the number of independent elastic stiffness constants is reduced first further if the crystal possesses symmetry elements. Like always in physics, symmetry is always your friend. So mm. it's a good thing that the universe likes symmetry. So uh, we assert that the elastic energy density of a cubic crystal is U equals one half C one one. Then we have E X X squared plus E Y Y squared. So the strain in all directions plus one half C four four e squared yz plus e zx squared plus e x y squared plus c12 e y y e z z plus e z z e x x plus e x x e y y let's look at this for a second um so we're saying this for part first part makes sense second part c44 so we have Y, Z, Z, X, X, Y. Yeah, those are the components that stay. And then we have um, all possible permutations of the cross terms. So Y, Y with Z, 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 Z with X, X, and X, X with Y, Y. And we're saying that no other quadratic terms occur such that X, X, and X, Y do not go, Y, Z, and Z, X do not go, and then X, X, and Y, Z do not go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the minimum symmetry requirement for a cubic structure is the existence of four threefold rotation axes. So the axes are, are in the 1, 1, 1 in the equivalent directions, figure 17. So the effect of a rotation of 2 pi over 3 about these four axes is to interchange the x and y according to these schemes. So yeah, when you rotate by 2 pi over 3, x goes to y, which goes to z, which goes to x again. So you basically get back to where you started from is the point. Okay, so under the first of these schemes, for example, we can say e x x squared plus e y y squared plus e z z squared goes to e y y squared yes yeah, so you're just moving it around basically e x x squared which are two equivalent things right similarly for all other terms and the 43 parentheses so for these these are the ones that work in terms of the rotation axes so 43 is invariant under rotation considerations but each of the terms in 44 right here uh, is odd in one or more indices so rotation in 45 can be found which all change the signs of the terms. So because EXY equals negative EX negative Y, for example, so 44 are not invariant under the required operation. So you basically be getting an extra negative sign. So these are our threefold rotation axes by two pi over three. So we rotate it once, rotate it twice, rotate it three times. So you can imagine we take this point right here, rotate it once, I think it takes us to here then it takes us to there, somewhere over there, and then it takes us back to here. So it's one rotate, two rotate, three rotate. And you can pick any corner point there and try it for yourself as well. Okay, so it remains to verify that the numerical factors in 43 are correct. 43 is this one right here. So probably C11, C44, and C12. Uh, so what we wanna say then is we take the partial with respect to XX, which has to equal the force in the x direction uh, on the x plane, or x face, I guess, which is C11 
EXX plus C12, EYY plus EZZ from, you know, this fancy stuff over here. So we have this stuff right here. So we basically don't want to account for any of these because they don't work under the rotation axes. So we need to see if this is correct. So wait, why is it C12 times all that crap? Let me see. C12 EYY plus EZZ. Hmm. Why is it like that? Okay. So the appearance of C11 EXX agrees with 38. Okay. That's what I meant. Okay. That's what I was just talking about. Um, on further comparison, ah, see, that's exactly what I was talking about, right? Because we get this C13 plus EZZ, and all of these need to remain, right? So that means C12 is equal to C13. Um, so then we see that uh, C14, which equals C15, which equals C16, half to equal zero, because we can't have those strain components, right, from symmetry. So then we basically then get is that uh, C12 has to equal C13. So we just further reduced our amount of components. And then we want to check the 441. So we do partial del xy is equal to x in the y direction. So C44 exy. So we want to check C44. If we go up here, we find C44. C44 is over here. So that's the y in the z direction, right? Which is what we're saying here, right? Make sure I'm saying this right. Okay, does that say y in the x direction? What is that? Yeah. A y in the z direction is C44. Oh. And they're saying it's 43. 43 is this one right here. We want EYZ. EYZ, I agree. EZX, I agree. So all these are here in EXY. This is what we want. Okay. And then partial of XY is X and the Y. X and the Y. He has this right here. Why is it six though? Maybe they messed up or I'm just tweaking. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, my bad. I just probably could have kept reading. Okay, so yeah, they do have X and the Y. So we want this, right? But if we look, we see then for the X and the Y direction, right? We get all these C6s, right? So then this, that tells us then that this has to be zero, 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 this has to be zero. And this right here has to equal the C44 component. Um, so then that's what that C61 equals C62, which equals C63, which equals C64, which equals C65, which all equals zero. And then C66 has to equal C44 from our earlier expression here. So then basically we can get an array of values for the elastic stiffness for a cubic crystal to this fancy dancy looking matrix where we see that a lot of the stuff gets zeroed out basically. If it lets me, there we go, it's screenshot. That's, it's just extremely laggy because, oh, okay, I guess we'll wait. <laughs> Probably pressed uh, paste too many times, Jesus Christ. All right, whatever, I'll just leave it like that. But the point is, right, we get all the diagonal components today and we see that it's basically just all three of these are equal. All three of these are equal. So we have two, and then we have all these are equal, all these are equal. So we basically have three components only. Okay. Um, and then we get for, and that's just by repeating all the stuff. So for cubic crystals, the stiffness and compliance constants are related that C14 is equal to one over S for four, C11 minus C12 is equal to S11 minus S12. Inverse, so they have the inverse relationship, right? Because one's unit of pressure, one's unit of pressure inverse. So then C11 plus two C12 is equal to 
S11 plus 2S12 to the minus 1. Um, and these relations follow when we evaluate the inverse of this matrix over here. Okay, nice. Wow, this is going to be a very long video, I'm sorry. Um, we don't, whatever. All right, that's what it takes to get through one chapter. So let's do a real quick, see how much more is left. Oh, we have all the wave stuff left. Oh, we're almost done. Nice, a couple pages left. All right, we're going to get to the complicated stuff soon, though, unfortunately. But okay, so uh, next topic is bulk modulus and compressibility. Ability. All right, nice. So let's consider the uniform dilation such that basically you have the same in each direction. EYY, EZZ, which equals one third delta. Remember, delta is like V prime minus V over V, right? I think. Nice, I remember correctly. Perfect. All right. So basically, they're all equal. So for this deformation, the energy density of the cubic crystal. Right, is going to be given by 1, 6, C11 one, one, plus 2, C12, two, two, delta squared. So we can define the bulk modulus by the relation that U is equal to 1 half bulk modulus delta squared, which is equivalent to the definition, right, from delta, that uh, minus V dP dV. Uh, such that B is equal to one third C11 plus two C12. And then we can define the compressibility. Compressibility K such that K is equal to one over B. So values of B and K are given in table three. Table, we gotta scroll hella, don't we? Table eight, yeah, wow. Well, just look how far we've come, that's a good thing. Table five, table three. Here, I told you we'd go back to this, table three. So, out of curiosity, let's look at argon, I'm doing a lot of argon, so compressibility and bulk modulus, blah, blah. blah. So, argon, right, has compressibility of 79. Uh, which I think means it's pretty compressible versus like, I don't know, it's like something that's like not compressible at all, like lithium, 8.62. Okay. Hopefully I don't have that backwards. But yeah, all right. Scroll all the way back. Wow, we are we did a lot of work today. That's good though. All right, nice. So blah, blah, blah. Nice. Okay. Now... We can do elastic waves in cubic crystals, see how they kind of permeate or move. Elastic waves in cubic crystals. So we're going to do cubic, right? Because all that nice symmetry lets us do that matrix in equation 50 where it's, you know, it's a lot simpler, right? Imagine if we had a unique one for each direction. That would be terrible. Okay. So, um, I considering as in figures 18 and 19, these are figures 18 and 19. So we have a volume of a cube. Then imagine we have a bunch of springs. So uh, the forces acting on elements of volume in the crystal we obtain the equation of motion in the x direction as p partial u dt squared, which is dxx over dx plus dxy over dy plus dxz over dz, where again, uh, xx is this direction right here, I guess like this direction, right, because it's the x plane, so normal to the x um, axis, uh, but also and then in the x direction, and then we have all the other ones. All right. So here, rho is the density. Uh, that's a rho, my bad. Or obviously, rho is density, mass over volume. Um, and then we have uh, u is the displacement in the x direction, and then... Right, the displacement in the x direction is given by the displacement in the x x direction, x to the y direction, x to the z direction. Okay, so we have similar equations for the y and z direction, so out of curiosity, so then it'd be rho d squared, or del squared v, sorry, over del t squared is equal to del, it should be 
y x over del x plus del y y over del y plus del z shit sorry y z over del z like that that's what they mean and then so forth for the z direction which i won't rewrite okay so it follows that then that this row it's not a row my bad row of del squared u del t squared this equation right here is going to be uh, c11 del exx over del x that's this component right here plus c12 then we have del eyy over del x plus del ezz over del x remember we're just rewriting our uh, these equations right here from what we found right i guess you can also use the matrix form as well so right xx is these things right here uh okay and then we have plus c44 del exy over del y plus del e z z z x over del z sorry about that okay nice so using the definitions we basically get let's go screenshot this because i've been writing a lot <laughs> hopefully that pastes within the next minute or so nice it pasted Excellent. Okay, I won't move it. It's fine. Okay, so then we get. Um, he's just replugging in in terms of u now, right? Like so. Okay, yeah. So we're just rewriting in terms of the definition for u, right? Which was the x direction being changed. So the xx x y x z okay so let's look at the figure now just to kind of see what we're talking about so we have a cube of volume uh del x del y del z uh acted on by a stress negative x x in the x direction on the face of x such that x x is given x plus delta x is approximately that it's approximately the same thing plus the partial on the x face in the x direction times the displacement in the x direction. Okay. So the net force is given by um, by using xx over del x and the del x del y del z. Okay. So other forces in the x direction arrive from variation across the cube of the stress, which is not shown. Um, okay. So then the net x component of the force on the cube is fx is del xx del x plus del xy del y plus del xz del z. Well, remember, this is just all the forces in the x direction times the volume like this, which should make sense. Okay, so the force equals the mass of the cube times the component of the acceleration in the x direction. So then the mass is rho del x del y del z right because rho is m over v so m equals rho v and then this right here is the volume okay and then the acceleration right is del squared u dt squared uh, so the corresponding equations of motions for the y and the x direction are found again by symmetry uh, instead of having to redo all the math right we can just basically change the subscripts and we get the exact same thing, except we change the U with the V, basically. So if we look at A, B, C, so we have A. All we did here is for the Y direction, we changed these with Vs, right? Let's check that. Check these with Vs. And then we changed V to U, W to X, right? Or I guess to W stays the W for that. And then the same thing for the W direction or Z direction. So now we want to look for simple special solutions to these equations because these wave equations look kind of bad. So let's look for 57A, this one right here. Um, uh, one solution is given by a longitudinal wave. So U is equal to U naught E to the I, I, K, X minus omega T, where U is the X component of the particle displacement. So both the wave vector and the particle motion are along the x cube edge. So k 
k is 2 pi over lambda like usual is the wave vector and lambda well, i mean omega is 2 pi ugh, nu i guess which is the angular frequency um, if we substitute 58 into 57 this is 58 and then 57a is this equation right here um, we find that omega squared rho is equal to c11k squared thus the velocity right velocity frequency over wave vector omega over k in the one zero zero direction is given by oh god vs is equal to nu lambda which is omega over k is c11 over rho to the one half so if we consider a transverse or shear wave with the wave vector along the x cube edge and the particle displacement v in the y direction such that v is equal to v naught e to the i kx minus omega t um, if we substitute into now the b equation to so the y direction we get omega squared rho is equal to c44 k squared right where we're just taking this from this expression here sorry where is it this expression here because we're in the b direction now right um, and then we get the velocity similarly it's going to look very similar as the first one where the velocity is given by c44 over rho to the one half notice the similarities between these two okay and then the identical velocities obtained at the particle displacement is the z direction so thus for a k parallel to the one zero zero the two independent shear waves have equal velocities now this is not true for k in a general direction of the crystal just for the one zero zero direction I'm getting tired of writing, so I'm just going to screenshot this page and talk about it so I can write over it. Ooh. All right. It's now in the 110 direction, which I guess I probably should have specified what these directions are. Um, God damn it. <laughs> it's this one note thing is huge now, this file, so it's kind of laggy, but whatever. Okay. So the 110 direction, right? is this direction so if I have X Y Z um, it's that direction X Y Z okay so uh, propagate in the face diagonal direction of a cubic crystal so one one zero direction because the elastic constants can be found simply from the three propagation velocities in this direction so let's consider a shear wave that propagates in the X Y plane okay X Y plane is this plane right here uh, with uh, particle displacement um, W in, z in the Z direction such that we have so the, the, it's like it goes like that if that makes sense like in the plane it's the displacement is in the Z direction right um, so we have W is equal to W naught E to the I KX X plus KYY minus omega T so then 32 C 32C, that's a long time ago. 32C is this expression right here. ZX is all that good stuff. Uh, gives us omega squared. Oops, let me scroll a bit more down. Okay, it gives us omega squared rho is C44, KX squared plus KY squared, which is just C44, K squared. Independent of the propagation direction of the plane. So if we consider other waves that propagate in the xy plane with particle motion in the xy plane, we can let um, u equal u naught, same thing, and then v equal v naught. So this is y direction, this is x direction. Um, and then from 57a and 57b, we get these expressions regardless, right? So this squared, this there, and then this right here for the u, which comes directly from this right here. Right, we have the C11 and the C44 with both, and the C12 plus C44 with both. Right, so C11 plus KX squared comes from this line right here, and then the C44 KY squared U uh, comes from this line right here, right, because it's all V there, and then the C12 plus C44 comes from right here. Okay. Um, and then the same thing for the y direction, so v. Nice. So then um, 
this these pair equations, right, has a particular simple solution for a wave in the 1, 1, 0 direction for which kx equals ky. In other words, you have the same in both directions. So the condition for a solution is that the determinant, so if we want to find a solution for this, right, we need to make sure the determinant of this equals 0. And we can kind of immediately see this equals 0, right, because it's this subtracted this minus this subtracted this. These two are equal. These two are obviously 0. Um, these two multiplied together, right? is uh, so these two go away right so then we basically get uh, God uh, I don't want to do this okay whatever so we have negative omega squared P plus one half C one one plus C four four K squared minus this so it's just W squared row plus one half C11 plus C44 K squared. So it just basically doubles, right? So then we get the roots of, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So then we get the roots of, I'll just screenshot it to be honest. We get these roots, nice. So these are the values that have to, for the condition of it to be zero. And the first root, right, this one right here, describes a longitudinal wave. And the second root describes a shear wave. So how do we determine the direction of the particle displacement? Well, the first root, when substituted into 67, so right here, um, it gives us this expression right here. Uh, 1 half C11 plus C12 plus 2C4 K2U has to equal um, 1 half C11 plus C44 K2U plus 1 half C12 C44 K2V. So when the displacement component satisfies U equals V, thus the particle displacement is along the 1, 1, 0 direction, right? Because if they X and the Y component equal each other, then it's like that. Um, and thus is parallel to the K vector. Then the second uh, root uh, substitute the upper equation of 67 and to here again um, is going to give us uh, the value of when u equals minus v so the particle displacement is along the 1 minus 1 0 direction so uh, like that right yeah like that um, it is perpendicular to the k vector right nice that's correct um, so selected values of the Adiabatic last system is constants of cubic crystals at low temperature, blah, blah, give table 11. Okay, let's just look at these diagrams on the left over here. Um, wave in the 1, 0, 0 direction. We have C11 for longitudinal, transverse is C44. In the 1, 1, 0 direction, we have these kind of more complicated, slightly more complicated than what we just found before. Longitudinal is 1 half C11 plus uh, C12 plus 2C4, which we saw right here. And then the first transverse wave is given by C44, and the second one is given by this right here, uh, C11 minus C12. Very nice. And then you also get waves the 111 direction as well. Slightly more complicated, but just one third and then one third. Okay, nice. So we can look in table 11, they were talking about here. Um, selected values of adiabatic elastic con stiffness constants. And I guess for these crystals, we get these values for C11, C12, and C44, and we see how they change according to the cubic structure of it, or according to the elements. Okay, nice. So basically, uh, these are the normal modes of wave motion in a crystal for a given magnitude and direction of wave vector k. So in general, the polarizations, the direction of particle displacement of these modes are not exactly parallel or perpendicular to k, but in the special uh, propagation directions of 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 0, of a cubic crystal, two of the three modes for a given k are such that the particle's motion is exactly transverse to k, and the third mode of motion is exactly longitudinal, parallel to k. So the analysis is much simpler in these special directions than in general directions, so that's why we did them. So, <clears throat> Jesus. Good work today. Let's quickly summarize what we just went over. So let me just screenshot these, and then I'll just briefly talk about it because I know you guys are tired I'm tired um, 
So crystals of inert gas atoms, right? So argon, noble gases, blah, blah, blah. Stuff with their valence shells, valence shells filled are bound by the van der Waals interaction that we saw scales as one over R to the six from, you know, expanding the Coulomb interaction and so forth. Um, the repulsive interaction between atoms generally arises uh, from the electrostatic repulsion of overlapping charge distributions, right? So you have a plus, minus like that, plus, minus like that. These get too close. We have that repulsion. Um, um, ionic crystals are bound by the electrostatic interaction. So plus, plus to minuses. So you have like a plus and a minus like that. Um, and the electrostatic energy of 2n ions of charge, so n molecules, or n bonds, sorry, is given by this kind of stuff with the Madelung constant. And R in the Madelung constant, right, we can, is given to us basically depending on if it's FCC, BCC, HCP, whatever. Um, metals are bound by the reduction in the kinetic energy of the valence electrons and in metals as compared to the free atom and a covalent bond is characterized by the overlap of charge distributions of anti-parallel electron spin and then the poly contribution to the repulsion is reduced for anti-parallel spins right because then you're in a lower energy state um, and thus makes it possible for a greater degree of overlap and the overlapping electrons bind their associated ion cores by electrostatic attraction okay that was a lot of words and a lot of good stuff but hopefully you guys had learned something today sorry if i went super fast or if i got confused along the way it tends to happen but yeah thank you guys for listening and i might be making a video on chapter two and chapter one soon of kittel's book of introduction to solid state physics so thanks for listening guys and i will see you guys in the next video